Today on This Old House. Our project is loaded with hardscape, but today we're gonna take a look at the softer side. And I'll show you a way to replicate a 130 year old shingle. What happened to all this plumbing here? I've never seen anything like this before. There's already rot going on in that trunk. So what have you found up here? Well, a bit of a surprise. It's really the classic plumber's lament. Nice. It's five bathrooms, it's a kitchen, it's a full new mechanical. It's, it's going to be a big one. Sounds like you guys have a plan. I think we do. <laughs> the money's in the detail. That is beautiful. Hey there, I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to this old house here in Narragansett, Rhode Island where you can see behind us the project is very much underway. This right here is an addition. So down on the first floor there is a two car garage and actually a cabana out back. Up on the second floor is going to be a master suite and that connects to the main house. Down here on the first floor there is a mud room and a little powder room and it's connecting to this building right here. That's an 1889 Queen Anne Victorian. We got the lull out today because the guys are doing some work on the barge rafters. That's one of the historical details that was on this original house. You can see it going all the way up there onto the gable ends. So that barge rafter detail is being replicated and put on the new addition. We've got all the different shingle styles going on right there. We've got the beautiful front porch that has been rebuilt. These pillars right there, the posts have been saved as well. So a lot of replicating for the new house and a lot of restoration on the old house. Now, one of the things that the Historical Commission allowed us to do was this part of the porch right here. It used to be two or three season space with just single pane windows right here. It is now going to be pushed out so that all of that space is finished living space. And then you've got this beautiful bay right here. Now, when we got to this house, well, this was the dining room, and it was not very good looking. It was in bad shape. And these windows were pretty beat up too, but you could tell that they were beauties. Stained glass, worthy of being saved. And so, hey, Chris, how are you? Tommy, good hey. to see you. How are you? So you were uh, there at the shop when these windows were being restored by Riley? Yeah, they did a lot of work to these windows. Some of them they were able to salvage. Uh, they had to steam off the lead paint and then rebuild or patch whatever they could of some of the sash. And ones that they couldn't rebuild, they actually made new ones that look exactly like it. Gotcha. And the glass, Chris, some of it was broken, some of it was in good shape. How do we handle that? Some of it had to be replaced, so we brought it to the glass shop, they replaced what needed to be replaced, and then they reglazed the whole sash. Glazing's key, right? Glazing's very important. It's pitched like that to shed the water, but it's tight up against the glass, so it actually stops air from moving in between there, keeping the window tighter. So we've got new sills in place. You guys have got the jams and the casings up right here. Are these right. sash ready to go in? So the whole thing is new here. And one of the benefits to this is by making it new, we're able to put weather stripping or beaded oh, yeah. weather stripping right there. You got a little gasket. I bet you that wasn't there back in the 1880s. It, it definitely was not. And you can see it'll be right here on the parting bead. There'll be one there. The sash will go against it. So the windows will be much more efficient than they were, that's for sure. Beautiful. Okay. All right. So we start by putting this into the opening. We can start at the bottom. This is the top sash. Yeah. But we lay it in. Push it tight against the weather stripping. And then we slide our meeting rails into it, our parting beads, with the weather stripping on it. And we push it down, follow the angle of the sill, push it into the dado. So that is the piece that separates top sash from bottom sash. Correct. Keeps them in their track, basically. Yes. There you go. So those are the parting beads, and what we can do now, that gives a channel for the sash to slide in. So when this top sash goes all the way up, it won't fall into the room. Gotcha. And it'll be weather stripped. And in your right hand there, Tommy, that's the original hardware that uh, was on these windows, helping to hold it in place. Yeah, it's almost like a friction fitted, spring loaded. So when I squeeze it, it there's a little there's a little lever that goes out like that. When I squeeze it, it pulls that in, and the window falls right down. Beautiful. So psyched we were able to save those. Right. So now the next thing we do is we push this all the way up, let it stand on its own, because it will, and now we can put the bottom sash in right against this weather stripping. Gotcha. 
So before you put that bottom sash in, Tommy, this is that hardware you're talking about right here. Right, so when I squeeze it here, you can see that goes right in, and there's two jaws right here. This stops the window from going up, so it's like a lock, and this one stops the window from sliding down. Just compression, that's beautiful. Glad we could save that, and I know Riley even found some uh, yeah. to replace the stuff that couldn't be saved. So I push it into the opening like that. So then we put a bead right here on the inside, which goes into this dado and into the miter at the top. And that holds the window in place. 120, 130 years later, Tommy, we have the original windows still in place, still operational. Good as new. Better than new. Generation Next is the name of our initiative for encouraging young people to come into our building trades. And this season, we are back at it, this time with the help of our electrician, Ben Giles. Ben, good to see you. Hey. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. What we got here? I'm Zach. Zach, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Apprentice for this guy? That's right. My condolences. <laughs> that sounds good. First of all, let's talk about what you guys are working on here. Right, so we're going to start cutting in this panel. Um, you know, we've pretty much roughed the whole house now, so we're looking at getting some power in for these guys to work for the rest of the project. Gotcha, all right. And Zach, how long you been at it? This is my third week now with Ben. I'm going to be working with him for about six weeks. Yeah. And, and what brought you to the electrical trade? Where did that interest come from? Something that interested me, yeah. just because I didn't really want to go the traditional route with schooling. I wasn't one to sit in the classroom all the time. I really yeah. didn't like it. And along with the debt that goes with that, I didn't think it was really worth it. Okay. A reasonable decision, I would say, on your part. And your decision um, at this point to pursue electric versus, say, plumbing or carpentry or another trade, where'd that come from? I've always been a kid who's into electronics, computers, things like that. Yeah. I just thought it would be something that most interesting out of any other trade. How have you found it so far for the last three weeks? It's, it's tough work uh, in, the, in the beginning. Uh, but, uh, Tell me about that. What makes it tough? What, what, is it the not knowing what's going on? Is it listening to this guy? You can guy? be honest. It's okay. Uh, once in a while when you mess things up and get yelled at. But, really? I mean, that hasn't happened that much. So yeah. Ben's pretty forgiving. So. Yeah. All right. And what's the plan? What do you think is going to happen after six weeks? What do you want to do? Where do you want to end up? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I think um, there could be other job opportunities through just a company that's sponsoring me right now. Yeah. They have told me that they have about 900 jobs available, so I might be offered something like that. Gotcha. But um, we'll have to wait and see. So at the end of the process, you might have yourself a job or even a career, and they may have someone else into the skilled trades. That's what it's sounding like so far. Not yeah. such a bad bargain, yeah. huh? Yeah. So, you know, when you take on a young apprentice, and no disrespect, Zach, I mean, it slows you down, and it probably costs you money. Why are you doing that? First of all, I think that the, the Generation Next thing is great. You know, I, th I think any attention that we can call to that program and, and maybe try and get some kids that... You know, don't realize there's an alternate option for them out there, a trade or a good, a good career in the trades. Um, you know, getting those kids aware that maybe that's out there is a great thing that I'm happy to help out with. It's just kind of part of it. You get used to it. Um, you know, he's probably about the 30th kid that I've trained from, you know, one job or another or, you know, my own company. Um, and to be honest, I kind of enjoy it. You know, I feel like I have a skill that I can share with somebody. Um, and it's really the reward is kind of there for me just on that level so i mean that is part of the job too right i mean it's part of the tradition in the trade where the master teaches the apprentice yeah and, and honestly I, i've always thought that was super cool right that goes back thousands of years so you've got these kids that would go and live with like the local carpenter or live with the local blacksmith and he was responsible for them and and you know as a business owner a good business owner i think you should feel the same way about the kids that come to work for you you know, you're responsible for their future career. So how you teach them and how you treat them and, you know, the things that you say to them and the things that you train them up in are going to affect them for the rest of their life. I think that's a pretty, pretty cool responsibility and pretty cool to run into these guys, some of them 15 or 18 years later, and they're successful. And, and I think that's a pretty awesome thing. It's an awesome feeling as a business owner or having been their boss in that situation. Um, yeah, there's some real value in that, too, so it's a part of it that I've always really enjoyed. Well, Zach, if they ain't yelling at you, they don't care about you. So <laughs> that probably just means he's looking out for you. you so want you to come learn. to learn. Yeah. <laughs> Good. All right, well, I'll let you guys get back to it. you got a lot to figure out right there. All right. 
Here on the shingle style Queen Anne, there are almost as many shingle patterns on this house as there are shingles. And last time we installed the step shingles on the front porch. Now we're going to install the scholar pattern. The problem is we can't buy that exact size off the shelf and with historical committee they want it to match. So what we're going to do is make them on site. Hey Adam, how's it going over here? Good Tommy, how are you? Alright, what's the plan here? Um, so I'm just selecting the best shingles we got here to make the scallop pattern. Okay, how wide are they? They're going to be four and three quarters to match the existing shingles on the house. That's exactly right, according to the historical committee. You know it. All right, so about how many do we need and where are they going? We need about 100, and they're only going to go on this front gable of the new garage and on the back gable. Okay, so 100's not too bad. Not too bad. All right, so you're going to rip them? I am. Got you some to start. Four and three quarters, gonna fit right in there, perfect. Now there's several different ways that we could do this. We could do it with a saber saw, cut around like that. We could cut it with a band saw or even a scroll saw. But what I like to do is I like to set a jig up so that the, the shingle will spin around and we're gonna use a, a router by cutting it that way. That way they'll all match the same and we don't have to fine tune it if we cut with a jigsaw, it's a little bit different. So I'll mount this underneath All right, so what we're using in here is a straight cutting quarter inch bit. And the idea of that is kind of about an inch and a quarter cutting length. The idea of that is it gives us more cutting. So I, I can cut as many as the shingles we want with this height, and then we can drop it down so we have a sharper edge, cut a few more. So I'll push it up as high as I can go, and I'll just lock it in. Now the jig's pretty simple, but the shingle design isn't a full half round. It's actually an arc of a circle down here. So the, the design of the shingle is basically a four and three quarters with an inch and three quarter up for the arch. So we have to think of it as a five inch radius. All right, now the center point right here, or the diameter or the radius is really set for a five inch diameter, but the shingle is only four and three quarters. So because we're the center point here, two and a half, when I swing this, it exits out at four and three quarters giving us the arch that we need and I glued a piece of sandpaper in here so when we set the shingle on the sandpaper and cut it it won't slide all right now we're ready to make a cut The other pattern that we have to match is up over the eyebrow window. That's a sawtooth detail and we have to cut it on site with the bandsaw. Now I could trace this one right here, but it's really rough, the paint's all there and I don't really want to mess with the paint. So what I'm going to do is I took those measurements and I'll just mark it off on the shingle right here. Okay, line for my height. Now I mark the sawtooth off. And I'll just give me a direction so I don't get confused. <laughs> and I'll try to cut two at a time.
And there is our sawtooth detail right there. During the lockdown, we couldn't continue making the television show, but Jeff, you and your guys could continue construction. Yeah. You guys are very busy. Um, you know, the front porch on this house is probably one of the signature features. Right. Now, we want to save it, but man, it was in bad shape. <laughs> the house was in good shape, but the porch really suffered from deterioration. We had some major rot on this side. The footings were crumbling. You know, the porch decking was sagging. All the joists were rotted. Basically, the only thing we could salvage from that porch were the columns. Right. So they were in surprisingly good condition. We were able to repair them, salvage them, repaint them, and reinstall them. And you can see some of them in place right there. But other than that, you guys had to essentially cut the whole thing off, yeah. which was a pretty big operation. Yeah, you know, it wasn't holding on by much. You know, Ryan was able to get the forklift underneath that roof system, basically with a few sawzall cuts and pull it, extract it right off the building. So the demolition went pretty smooth in that regard. Drop it down and then rebuild it. So in the rebuilding process, uh, let's start from the bottom up. We've yeah. got these brick piers. You guys replicated those? Yeah, so we, we discovered that there was really no frost protection at all. So now we have to be 42 inches in the ground. So we trenched, poured us footing, and then we used the bricks that we salvaged from the chimney inside and we rebuilt these piers being historically correct and then we, we built new from there. And the side wall of the porch had always been solid shingles. Yep. Um, those couldn't be saved, took them off, but let me look at how you guys replicated it. Beautiful detail we there. We matched every detail in, in exactness. The cap, the shingle style, you know, pretty much everything is what it looked like a couple hundred years ago. Porch swing is gone, new decking is down, and when you step back and you look at this thing, I mean, as beautiful as the original, yeah. and a heck of a lot better than when we found it five yeah. months ago. Yeah. Really nice job. There's quite a bit of hardscape on this project. We have a soak pool going in. We have an outdoor kitchen that includes a wood-burning pizza oven, a grill, and we even have a putting green. But that's not why we're here today. We're here to talk about plants. Hey, Jen. Hey, Michael Cassiani. How are Hello. you? Very, very good. good. Yourself? Very, very good. So good. I was wondering, we still have time, but what are we thinking for this front area? I think we need to soften all this hardscape going in. We completely agree. So we're, we would like a mixture of evergreens and perennials that'll come up every year. Right. Uh, you don't want it bare all season. Correct. So correct. in this area, I believe, this is going to be where you come out of the house to a landing. Absolutely. Yep. And this is going to be limestone and that's going to connect to the driveway and then have another walkway that will connect to the main entrance. Yes. Right? So this area is going to be planting. Correct. So we talked about maybe an ornamental tree, maybe a Japanese maple. Yep. But I think soft. you yes, soften the area. That's what you're interested yep. in, right? Yep. And then you liked an evergreen ground cover, maybe juniper or something? Yes. Okay, and then perennials, so there's just seasonal plants coming up. We would like flowering at all different times of the year if possible. Okay, so we could definitely put some perennials because yeah. they come back every year. That would okay. be ideal, okay. not having a plant. Awesome. Less maintenance, the better. <laughs> okay, so then we walk down this limestone walkway and it goes this way, and yeah. then we're gonna have a border of cobblestone, Correct. right? To yep. hold the edge. And then as we travel this way, it'll, the walkway goes all the way to this entrance. And then for out here in the yard, we talked, you're gonna have the synthetic grass, right? Synthetic turf? Correct. So I think it'd be nice to have it come right up to the edge of the cobblestone of the walkway. Just to have a nice clean edge. I'm in agreement. Like line, just, good? yep. All right. And then we move to foundation plantings. So you want something to soften this whole area, right? Correct. Okay, so maybe, but you, de Michael, you mentioned boxwoods, or I mentioned boxwoods. I don't mean yes. to be a boxwood pusher, yes. but I think it's a great yeah. plant for you because it's it's lo pretty low maintenance, stays green all year round, and I think it will do well in this area. So if we mix some of the boxwoods and hydrangeas do well here for a pop of color. Some grasses maybe. Yep, ornamental grasses to yep. underplant it. That would be great. And then we could travel all the way down here and so we don't have, we could bump the straight line out to have some kind of circular edge. Yeah, we, we'd like some sort of S's or some, you know. Yeah, 
Some nice, uh, some nice some curves. Curve. Yeah, I don't want it linear. And that would be great because that will give you the opportunity to anchor this corner for screening from the street. Yep. And I know you showed me some yellow, I, I believe they were canvasiferous shrubs or fern spray cypresses that we could maybe put three here to anchor the corner. Yep. Okay. And that will help screen and give you privacy from the street. Yes. Right? Yep. Yep. And then Cassiani, you also showed me a tree that you loved, yes. a tall evergreen. Yes. I think it was a blue atlas cedar. I believe so. It's yeah. either that or a spruce, so we could look at different cultivars, but yeah. something that gets like 30, 40 feet tall, because yes. um, having that double screening from the street will be well, beneficial. Just, yep. We have a lot of windows here, so I want something for a little privacy, okay. but still soft looking. Excellent. So then coming down, down this way, this is where the fence will be? Correct. So Correct. you have your porch, and then this will create privacy from this area. Um, yeah. And then this, and then the, synthe Correct. the synthetic turf will come all the way up to the fence. Yep. The planting, and, and then wrap around the planting with the planting bed. Yeah, wrap around. Perfect. So I think we have a great plan going on here. Hey, guys. Good to see you. Cassinet, Michael, Jen, Good how are you? you? Good, Kat. how are you? So uh, are you guys excited about the plan we coming your way? We are extremely excited. We're extremely excited about the plan. Jen has... Uh, an amazing design concept, and uh, we're looking forward to see it all come together. Well, you're in good hands right here. So, Jen, a little less dirt, a little more green coming our soften way. Soften it up, soften it up. Bring oh, a little okay. color in there. Awesome. All right. Well, we have got that and plenty more coming next time. So, until then, I'm Kevin O'Connor. I'm Jen Nawada. I'm Mike Campo Piano. Cassiani Campo Piano. For this old house here in Narragansett. Well, you can't do any worse than this. I know. We're going to like clean this up. It's going to be inch to green. Yeah, we'll get away. Just wraps right over there. Next time right on this old house. I'm feeling a lot better about the Yankee gutter when I see this much copper. A big hot water demand requires a big solution, and it comes in this small package. And we're going to show you how we duplicated these original corbels and installed them. Perfect match to what was on the house when we got here, and a beautiful detail to add. That is awesome, Tom. Yeah, that's great.